10 years earlier, and two months after discovering the light of the Buddha temple on Wutai Mountain, Liang and Lin began their life in exile. Nine years later, Lin Huiying did not even have the stamina to stand up for a photo with her friends. Her doctor warned that she had only five years left. At the end of July, the Liang family ended their nine years of exile and returned to Beiping. One day, soon after returning to Beiping, the daughter and mom were riding a tricycle and passed by the walled city at Beihai. After eight years of war, every moment of peace was enjoyed to the utmost. Yet the misfortunes of the Chinese were far from over. In the spring of 1946, before the Liang family returned to Beiping and before the ceasefire agreement between the nationalists and the communists had been signed, artillery boomed in the Northeast. Only a year earlier, Liang Sicheng wrote a letter to the president of Tsinghua University, Mei Yichi, suggesting that after the war, Tsinghua should establish a department of architecture. More than 10 years have passed since Tsinghua established the Institute of Technology. But architecture has still not yet become part of the curriculum. During the War of Resistance, cities all over the country were seriously damaged. In countries like the UK and the Soviet Union, even as the war was just beginning, plans for reconstruction were already being drawn up. In our country, however, not only are we lacking any plans, we are also lacking any talent. As an architect, Liang Sicheng began to think about how to rebuild home on the scorched earth. Tsinghua University approved his request and appointed him as head of the Department of Architecture. Beiping remained tranquil even though China was on the brink of war. All the major universities resumed operations in the fall of 1946. As the new term began, Liang hurried to the U.S. to take part in a study tour on post-war architectural education efforts. He also accepted an invitation from Yale University to lecture on Chinese architecture and art. The work of establishing the Department of Architecture at Tsinghua was left to the 24-year-old Wu Liangyong. Wu Lengyong graduated from the Department of Architecture of Chongqing Central University in 1944. During his college years, his articles in the college academic journal had impressed Liang Sicheng. In 1946, before Liang departed for the U.S., he wrote to Wu to invite him to help establish the new department at Tsinghua. 
，我说愿意啊，呃，他说你要愿意呢，就是你到清华大学来当助教，这个对我呃一生有很大的呃。有相当有决定意义的，可以这么说的。一进去了以后嘛，我就打听各个系，说将来要搞一个建筑系，叫梁思成，是梁任公的大儿子。说嘛说这个。他他儿子是国宝，他对这个建筑史历史啊，中国建筑史非常研究的非常深透。那么我就这里啊就联系连到这个梁先生的梁梁梁梁启超的儿子，就是就是我们的系主任了，梁思成。Zhang Dipei had been a military interpreter for the U.S. Army because he admired Liang. 美术的这方面更没有了解，但是我喜欢美术。There are 13 students in the first class. In the fall of 1946, the Department of Architecture began its first semester, with Wu Liangyong as the only accredited teacher. Most of the day-to-day -day departmental activities were discussed with Lin Huayin from her sickbed. This time, I saw Lin Xian when I was in Chongqing. 嗯，时候看他就完全不一样了。哎，他当然也休息过来了，而且，呃，也也也等于，呃，打扮打扮嘛，哎，就是，所以看他精神很好，谈风很健，哎，什么都谈。当时我妈就是。把他全部心血都拿出来帮这个吴先生把这个建筑系搞起来，从这个桌椅板凳啊、行政工作啊，一直到这个课程的设置啊，甚至是这个第一次学生怎么上课啊，什么，全部都都都参加，那真是花尽心血。但是当时呢，他既不是清华的教授，也不是清华的职员、职工，什么都不是，也不领任何工资。The Department of Architecture was gradually built up after the war. Zhang Depei saw Lin Huiying for the first time as she stood in the doorway to the hydraulics classroom in the temporary building for the department. I was looking at it. It was just a light. The person gave me the feeling. You can see it. One light. It was like a light in front of me. It was not a cigarette, a cigarette, a cigarette, a cigarette, a cigarette. 他一穿起的衣服来，一站起来，你就看见，哎呦，这人很高雅，很高贵，这个 very attractive。李艳这个这个气质上还是看出来，呃，跟电视剧上那个差距比较远。现在这批年轻的，他很难，他也没见过林徽因，很难理解。林先当时的他的思想、感情，所以也只能说最多学到一点皮毛或者怎么，这个这个思维快得不得了。你有时候要要跟着他走，都都都都跟着他思维走啊。有时候都，梁先本来是很幽默、很会讲，但是梁林在一起的时候，中心常常还在林，而不在梁。Created from scratch. The Department of Architecture at Tsinghua ended its first term in 1946. In early 1947, members of the original Institute for Research on Chinese Architecture joined Tsinghua's Department of Architecture. The initial professional training consisted of basic drawings of classical pillars and paintings in color. It was still based on the classical teaching model that had been adopted by the Academy of Fine Arts in Paris. Just as modernism was beginning to rage in architectural circles in the West, the war cut China off from the outside world. The modernist current that changed traditional teaching methods began with the Industrial Revolution in the early 20th century. All the new building materials, such as glass and steel, and new structural technologies created new possibilities. 
skyscrapers became a symbol of modernism. Modernism fiercely attacked the classical methods of teaching that relied too much on historical architectural styles, language, and history, and thus inhibited the creativity of the architect. It soon completely took over the architectural institutes in the U.S. and Europe. The Bauhaus method deny history. They were not interested in history. They would not study these books. And the way to learn architecture was to sit in your room with no references and to invent something. That, that's to be inspired, to be a genius. In the, in the Beaux-Arts system, they taught you how to use things. And if you were a genius, you could actually achieve great works. And if you were a, an ordinary architect, like most architects, you could do very good buildings because you knew a lot. The global modernist movement in architecture had an impact on architectural education, even though some scholars still had their doubts about it. Most university classes in the country are rather old-fashioned and are locked into the formalism of various factions. Our classes should be modeled after the methods developed by Gropius in the Bauhaus Academy. In 1946, Liang Sichung went to the U.S. in order to explore new developments in international architecture. This was a very delicate period in Sino-American relations, as their honeymoon, brought about by World War II, was soon to come to an end with the outbreak of the Civil War. In the fall of 1946, Liang Sichung returned to the U.S. Years earlier, together with his wife, Lin Huiyin, they had studied there. At the time, the study of architecture was virtually non-existent in their own country. During the following 20 years, they spent half of their time traversing China and half of their time during their life in exile collecting academic findings. When he once again set foot in America, he was already a world-famous architectural historian. He was the first Chinese scholar to deliver a systematic speech on China's architectural history on the global stage. During this year abroad, even more honors were awaiting him. In 1946, Liang Sichung visited Yale University to lecture on China's architectural art. In 2006, as the Yale Visual Resources Collection was sorting out its archives, over 400 slides that Liang Sichung had used during his lectures were discovered. Well, welcome to the Visual Resources Collection. Um, the Liang Sichang Collection of um, lantern slides and photographic prints has, has been here since 1947. Uh, they were made for Liang Sichang um, for his t own teaching purposes at his, during his time at Yale in 1947. We希望就是说，借由整理这批材料，然后借由开课跟鼓励研究生做研究，在未来呢，能够更注意的啊一项一个是全球化的角度，讨论梁先生不能只放在中国的一个角度，应该跳离开中国的一个角度。Architect/slash/architectural historian. Professor Nancy Steinhardt at Penn University is committed to the study of architectural history in Asia. She studied under John Fairbank at Harvard in the 1970s. At the time, Fairbank and his wife would hold weekly tea parties in their home. The guests were all students and scholars of China. I think one of the first times I met her, probably September of 1974, 
Wilma began, Wilma realized I was interested in Chinese architecture and said, oh, have you ever heard of Liang Zicheng? And I said, of course I've heard of Liang Zicheng. Everyone interested in Chinese architecture has heard of him. She said, well, I knew him. I knew him extremely well. After this, Wilma would often tell this student, who was so interested in Chinese architecture, about her close Chinese friends. Today, Nancy is a well-known scholar of Chinese architectural history. So I think, I think Liang made many contributions. One of his contributions certainly was bringing a field that was largely craftsmen building according to rules to the level of international understanding of how a person designs. That is bringing the concept of design to building. Liang also felt that it was very important for China and Chinese architecture to be part of an international vocabulary and discussion. I think Liang took very seriously his responsibility to his own historical past. And I think perhaps his greatest contribution, certainly one of his greatest, was making a whole nation aware of, the histo of its own historical past through architecture. During Liang Zicheng's second year in the U.S., in April 1947, Princeton University was celebrating its 200th anniversary. In the activities that followed the celebration, Liang was invited to head a forum on Far Eastern culture and society. More than 60 international scholars participated in the forum, including Liang's old friends, John and Wilma Fairbank. Liang Zicheng arranged an exhibition of images of Chinese architecture and also delivered two lectures, sculpture during the Tang and Song dynasties and architectural findings. Princeton awarded honorary PhD degrees to Professor Duvendak of Leiden University and to Liang Zicheng. Wilma Fairbank remembered, at the start of the celebrations, the tall, white-haired Duvendak wore a medieval headdress. Liang Zicheng, smaller, skinnier, and younger, was dressed in an extra-large Princeton black gown. There was a marked difference between the two men. The president of the university declared, Doctor of Literature Liang Zicheng, a creative architect and expounder of architectural history a pioneer in the field of Chinese architectural history and research, and a leader in restoring and protecting the architectural heritage of his country. Stored in the archives of Princeton University is a letter Liang Zicheng wrote to the president of the university principal upon receiving the honorary degree. He wrote, to somebody who spent his time and energy on pursuing what was mostly the leisure activity aiming to satisfy his curiosity, this kind of honor is really too much. On every corner, race, in 1947, the newly created United Nations decided to construct a building for its headquarters. Famous architects from all over the world gathered in New York. Liang Zicheng joined this group of designers as a Chinese delegate. These great architectural minds put their ideas together. Liang also contributed the wisdom of Chinese architecture to the group. Scheme 24, the proposal of Dr. Liang Shu Chang from China, 
was built around an inward-looking courtyard. With an east-west orientation, the Secretariat building would get the maximum of both light and ventilation in New York. I believe this will not only make it more comfortable for the people working there, but will allow them to work more efficiently. And it will save a lot of money in the air conditioning equipment for the building itself. The construction of the headquarters for United Nations, supported by the wisdom of architects from the world over, began in Manhattan in 1907. Liang Sichung stayed with his old friend Clarence Stein while he was taking part in the design of the headquarters. Stein was the creator of modern regional planning in the U.S. during the early 20th century. In 1935, Stein and his wife had traveled to Beiping, and there they met Liang Sichung and his wife. Many of the cities of Europe had just emerged from the ashes of war and were beginning to be rebuilt from the rubble. But the U.S., which had avoided the devastation of war, had an unusual opportunity to develop. Its housing needs surged due to rapid urban expansion. In a letter to Liang Sichang, Stein wrote, there is no question that the need of homes and all kinds of structures is so great that within the next 20 to 25 years, the great part of our buildings and cities will be replaced. Unless something is done to prevent it, the tendency will be to repeat all of the old blunders of street pattern congestion and all that. I think that the weaknesses of the old form of the cities are now so apparent that we can awaken the public to the need of a new form. Um, through the 1930s and 1940s, the, the idea of group housing or the manner in which um, uh, group housing should be designed uh, to serve its goals. And that's really a remarkable contribution. Faced with the uncontrollable urban development in the early 20th century, Stein spearheaded the design of a number of epoch-making urban housing projects that spread the concept of concentrated housing to organically disperse the population. Stein enthusiastically recommended Leon visit a number of American urban planning projects. After visiting a community along the Tennessee River, Liang Sichang wrote a letter to Stein. How I wish and hope that the Yangtze Valley project materialize and elevate the living standard of the Chinese. We need hundreds of TVA in China. However, in China, the winds of war were gathering north of the Yangtze. In 1947, as Liang Sichang was happily visiting various urban construction projects in the U.S., many Chinese cities were being bombed by artillery. In the summer of 1947, Liang had to speed up his itinerary and return home as quickly as possible to care for his ailing wife. Before he left the U.S., he took care of one last thing. He returned once again to the home of the Fairbanks to work with them on preparing the English manuscript of his book on the history of Chinese architecture. He brought from New Haven the precious drawings and photographs intended to illustrate his book and left them in my care. The text on which he had been working he decided to take with him. As he explained, the two-week ocean voyage across the Pacific would be an ideal time to complete it, and he promised to mail it back to me. Neither he nor I thought of making a copy of the unfinished manuscript for me to have a hand. Liang Sichang meticulously planned every stroke and image in his book on Chinese architectural history to present to the world. However, Little did he know that the text of the English version of History of Chinese Architecture and the images would remain separated and kept in China and the U.S. respectively for the next 30 years. 
Dear Wima, the few drops with you and yours in Franklin were wonderful, but how I wish Phyllis was there too. I dread goodbye. The uncertainty of a meeting again in the happy future is not a pleasant feeling. When I come to America again, I will never come without Phyllis, and I doubt very much whether she well enough again to travel. So we depend much on your coming to see us, but that is quite different from the form of us together in America, and that is what she had been wanting for years. It makes me very sad every time I think of it. I and my neglect and callousness are the main cause of her present state of poor health. I shall never forgive myself for that. I am rambling off with my deeper pain, for which there is no cure. Better stop. After this farewell, the four friends would never meet again. In 1947, Lin Huiying's health deteriorated dramatically. Well, I'm feeling weak and sad and very bored. Someday, when the full sense of hopelessness in every situation, the whole world over goes deeper down in me, I simply give up thinking, but stay depressed and under weather like a wet hen under a bit of hay. Or like any miserable-looking creature, bodily sick, and has no proper shelter. I am not feeling bitter, but just cannot believe that all those laughing, working, traveling days are over with me, or with anybody else in China. Shuda In December 1947, one of Lin Huiying's tuberculosis-stricken kidneys was removed, along with the threat of death, even if only temporarily. Darling, the rain is pattering on and on throughout the night. A gray streak of down has just touched up my papered window. As I lie listening, I remember so well another rain like this at the end of a summer not too many years back. Perhaps then it's Yu Taohe. That was a little valley way up the Fan River in Shanxi. I slept then in a small stone mill house made over into a summer palace. I could hear still the gushing water running down among the stones, strewn over the brook, and the little whistling sound passing by the tall, whipping young tree that grew alongside of the mills and the paths. Her bladder condition is much improved and can sleep sometimes as long as four hours in a stretch without interruption. With better sleeps, her strength is gradually returning though still very weak. With her strength returns her mental activity, which, as a nurse, I do not welcome. She burst into verse after verse. In the summer of 1947, 
Liang Sicheng returned to his country, which was engulfed in a civil war. In the fall, the Department of Architecture students, for the first time, met the head of the department. Liang was only 46 years old in 1947, but the years of exile had taken their toll on his health and he had aged prematurely. As China's architectural representative participating in the design of the headquarters of the United Nations, Liang was often invited to deliver speeches at various institutes in Beiping, and as a result, the Department of Architecture at Tsinghua attracted a lot of students. Guan Jiangyue, then a student at Yanjing University, after hearing a speech delivered by Liang Sicheng, decided to end his studies at Yanjing. He took the exam to enter the Department of Architecture at Tsinghua. The father had written in a letter to his children that he was a man with multiple interests, which was the reason he was not very successful. But his life was extremely rich, and he was never bored. Everything started from this outlook. Such a view was also important for his son as well. In 1946, the daughter who loved to read novels and was interested in literature examination to study Western languages at Peking University. I Liang and Lin had spent a life of hard work trying to solve the mystery of the book, Building Standards, compiled by Li Jia. So they gave their son a very special name, Tong Jia, follower of Jia. <laughs> the son, interested in drawing since youth, was rejected by the Department of Architecture because his exam score was two points below the acceptance level. At the end of 1947, 20 years after leaving National Northeastern University, Liang Sicheng once again was standing at the podium to deliver a lecture. <laughs> 非常整齐的 
，那个我记得他特别讲到那个呃哥特式建筑那个的时候，你想，我还记得，我可以给你说明一下他怎么一个画法。我们上课是在靠北面那一排，南面那个一排就是两排桌桌子，就是有做设计的，有的甚至有做木工的，都在那儿。那么做设计喜欢唱，先是轻轻唱，唱唱嗓嗓子都都很大了，两人就叫了：“哪位歌喉，请放轻一点，我说话我我讲课听不到了。”大家就不想了，待会儿又唱了。Before the founding of the People's Republic, the Department of Architecture and Engineering at Tsinghua recruited four classes of students, and they had a common nickname, Xuanwu. So Xuanwu, ah, is this. The Liang Yan, ah, once was giving a lecture, giving that Xuanwu is the master of building. That is, we, these people in this industry. 是归玄武管的，所以大家就笑，就就觉得玄武这个名字挺雅的，他还觉得挺雅的。梁山也默认了。呃，所以我们的学生啊，同学都是老玄武到了没有？就是这老同学到了没有？就叫玄武，就叫玄武。那个，我觉得这个大学上的很愉快，就在这，就遇见了这两位老师。Twenty years earlier, Liang and Lin had established the Department of Architecture at National Northeastern University. At that time, they used the classical education that they had received at the University of Pennsylvania as a model. This time, after Liang Sichang's second visit to the U.S., he applied insights from the new modernist movement to his teaching at Tsinghua. 让我们学什么？就学的我们当时叫抽象图案，现在叫构成，是不是叫 construction？ 我不知道这词是不是用。到现在不知道叫什么。构成。Although Liang Sichang applied the teachings of modernism, he didn't follow the anti-traditional trends of the movement. Quite the opposite, he personally established and taught a series of subjects on Chinese and foreign architectural history. Students also discovered some new subjects, such as urban planning, urban sociology, and population issues in their curriculum. So, in this side, there is a very important theoretical thinking, which is the Environmental Sustainability Theory. In 1947, during the Princeton celebrations, a meeting was held of some of the finest architects from all over the world, putting forth the new concept of planning man's physical environment. Quite In 1949, Liang Sichang wrote the guiding principles for the Department of Architecture at Tsinghua. Previous architects mostly saw their creations as carvings, for which only the appearance mattered. They ignored the close relationship between the buildings and the surroundings, and the relationship between the design of furniture and tools and daily life. In other words, the concept of architecture was being extended. It ranged from the design of lamps and dishes to entire cities and even to regions with different cities. 
Liang Sicheng changed the name of the Department of Architecture to that of the Department of Yingjian. Since Yingjian in ancient Chinese encompassed everything from the economy, management, design, and building to planning, he thought that the concept of architecture could hardly contain everything included in planning man's physical environment. The second class of students graduated with certificates from the Department of Yingjian in 1951. However, in 1952, just as Liang was drawing up the blueprints for his department, national reforms were being instituted, and Tsinghua became one of the eight major engineering institutes in the country. All of the liberal arts disciplines were moved from Tsinghua to other schools. Although he was teaching, Liang Sicheng was also in charge of administration. Liu Xiaoxue was from the third class. After graduating, he became the party secretary of the Department of Architecture and worked with Liang for many years. Tadayu 这个时期是在他学术思想最丰富、最辉煌的时期。因为什么都说,有什么没有什么不说的,没有什么顾忌的,或者外面怎么样子。In 1948, the offensives began in the northeast and central China. In areas controlled by the nationalists, there were student movements denouncing the famine, persecution, autocracy, and dictatorship. Neither Wei nor Sicheng appeared to have the slightest interest in politics. Brought up in the world of the arts, rational in thoughts, single-minded in their determination to achieve their personal ambitions in architectural history and poetry, This was the life that Liang Shicheng longed for. Blackboard, podium, and field studies. After returning from the US, Liang Shicheng put all of his energy and emotions into architecture, the discipline to which he had given his life, which for so long had been ravaged by the wars in China.